What's up, trade crew? Welcome back to HVAC R&D, hosted by Ryden Atzenhofer. I'm stoked to have a blue collar. Well, if I tell you what I was going to say, you might know who it is on the show. So I'll make you anticipate it for just a little bit longer. So let's get it going. Yeah, come on. This episode of HVAC R&D is brought to you by the show's newest vendor hub partner, Global The Source. If you're looking for training on any and all of their products, from their industry-changing AMRAD Turbo Series of capacitors to their Ditech surge protection and voltage monitoring, you can click the link in the HVAC R&D vendor hub and request training with your local or regional rep, easy peasy, at any time. It's free to you, and they're very happy to come out and take care of your customer, or excuse me, your company, your employees and really teach you guys the ins and outs of what they offer with all their products. This episode of HVAC R&D is also sponsored by BetterHelp. All listeners of the HVAC R&D podcast can take advantage of 10% off their first month of online mental health services with BetterHelp just by visiting the HVACRD.com vendor hub and clicking on the BetterHelp link to have discount code HVACRD automatically applied to their application. Just fill out your personal info and preferences and you can be matched with a therapist to fit your timeline and lifestyle within 24 to 48 hours and you can also switch your therapist at any time at no charge to you. It's hot out there, stress levels are running high from the warehouse to the ownership, and all of us have to remember to make time to take care of ourselves as well as all of our family and our customers. The show is also looking for its next HVAC R&D powered by sponsor. If you're interested, please reach out via the contact link on HVACRD.com or drop me a line at HVACRD at gmail.com and I'll send you the 2024 press kit recently updated with Q1 and Q2. I'm also grateful to be part of the 2024 AHR Workforce Development Team that has been working with Chicago's Prosser Career Academy and High School, a local high school with a dedicated HVAC program helping to bring the next group of tradespeople to the industry. A massive thanks to Bosch Home Comfort, Insight Partners, Hobbs & Associates, and the Air Control Concepts family of brands, as well as the Moore Sales Corporation for their support. I could not be happier to have such dedicated partners on board for this project. And if you're interested in helping the school with R&D and the rest of the team, please reach out to me about that as well. If this is your first time listening to the show, I welcome you and thank you for taking the time to give R&D a shot. I am based in North Carolina and the show is focused on research and development within the trades. The main objective is the pursuit of building a better, more knowledgeable community of HVAC professionals and fellow tradespeople by learning from the past and embracing new advances in the industry to help us all be better for the future. If you're not following HVAC R&D online, you can find the show on Instagram and TikTok at hvac.rnd. You can also find it as the HVAC R&D podcast on LinkedIn, Trade Hounds, and Facebook. Also, if you're listening to the weekly shows on Apple Music, iHeartRadio, Pandora, Spotify, or one of 20 other streaming platforms, please follow the show, like it, rate it, leave me a review, share me with your trade crew. If you want to work with me, you know how to do that. And also, don't forget to check out the website and the swag shop and join the mailing list at the bottom of the page. So now, you've seen his reels and stories of flying rooftops full of equipment, his warehouse yard stocked to the gills with equipment, and a few cats ready for projects, and of course, his love of meal prep, off-roading in the dunes of the southwest, all-around badassery in the world of HVAC. Please welcome the owner of Top Gun Mechanical, the blue-collar maverick himself, Ryan Figueroa. Hey, 
sir. Happy to be on here. Thanks for joining me, buddy. I appreciate it. I think it's been a, a long time coming. You know, we it talked has. about it quite <laughs> quite a bit now. Yeah, it definitely has. So, as everybody knows, we normally open this show with beverage. I know Ryan has graciously decided to come to the dark side with me and have a brew on the show. <laughs> so, Ryan, what you got? You know what? I had to bust out the top shelf for you tonight. I got myself a Tecate Light. My Mexican oh. heritage in me. There it is. I feel bad for not having a hitchhiker now. <laughs> I am sticking where I've been the last couple of shows. We've got a nice outlaw queued up. We've got Tecate and Outlaw. I think that's a that's that's a good combo. Yeah, why I not? Think. Right? Yeah. So cheers, buddy. Welcome cheers. to the show. Thank you. I'll drink to that. That's right. So, what you been up to lately? Anything, any new projects, adventures that have been keeping you busy? I know you constantly are throwing up updates on your stories. So, kind of what you working on right now? Um, you know, it's, to say the least, it's it's been a long summer. You know, we're, we're going hard right now. Uh, seven days a week, pretty much. 16 hours a day some days you know most days are 12s and it's 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 been a little nuts you know this is probably the one year where i uh feel like i've pulled my hair out i've, I've gained more gray hair than ever in this past summer let's put it that way <laughs> know that feeling yeah my wife loves to point mine out huh? she's like oh look there's another one yeah mine too you know my it, kind of funny story my my grandmother she actually had a full head of white hair at 18. We're not talking gray, we're talking white. <laughs> Dang. So, yeah, and I I got the gray early as well, you know. But now does I'll that take it. is that like a does that mean you're wise beyond your years? Yeah, that's why I said I'll take it. Is you know what? Is? It's like it, if it makes me distinguished or whatever you want to call it, whatever. I'll take it. Uh, it's just that, you know, you I, got that early silver fox syndrome going on. <laughs> yeah, I've embraced it. <laughs> <laughs> my my mother-in-law tells me you know what you're into you, you know we're all in the racing off road it's not gray it's chrome all right just take it i said okay, oh, i'll see you. there yeah. you go yeah you'll never know if your helmet is on or off depending on how <laughs> what color it is there you go that's right <laughs> i guess no uh i can't call you chrome dome that would just be mean right yeah uh, yeah I, i've been called worse things <laughs> you and me both. I was going to say, well, talking about um, off-roading, I know that's a big one for you. Yeah, we're, uh, you know, Glamis is world famous, and it's literally 20 minutes from my back door, or front door, I guess you could say. Um, we've been going out there since we were kids, and it you haven't looked it up look it up it's it's uh it's wild you know it's probably calmed down now more in in the last 20 years than than ever but during the you know early 80s and then early 2000s it was just like a giant party out there every holiday season i mean it just absolutely nuts too many people in one place but it's it's a good time you know a lot of horsepower a lot of fast cars and that's right up our alley now, what all do you drive out there? Now, have you, are you driving a truck? You're driving dune buggies? What you got? Yeah, so I've got a dual sport, uh, a Lumacraft with a 600 horse LS3. Whew. Yeah. And then, Give me that um, Chevy ended. Yeah, it's, it's nice. She, you know, it's like, like they say, when, when you turn her on, she returns the favor. That's for sure. That's definitely something I've never done is is do anything in the desert. I'll have to do that at some point. Oh, we're going to have to get my you way out, out there. there. Definitely. You know, we have to catch a flight, and when it's 70 degrees, it'll be it'll be a good trip. It won't be 120, so, you know. <laughs> it won't be 120. <laughs> no, thank you. Yeah. The, uh, when uh, Jaden and Jessica came out from RLS, they, they, they got the wrath of the heat for that 
that few days that they were here. I, I, you know, they initially had said, you know, we want to come out there. And I said, like, you, you know where I'm at, right? I'm not in San Diego. Yeah, we know. We've looked you up. Okay. I said, you know, it's going to be like 115 that week, right? Yeah, we, we, we're, we're going to bring shorts. I said, okay. If that's what you want to do, then yeah, it was, it was interesting. They had a good time though, I think. Yeah, I don't. I don't know how well uh, my paleness would do in 121 degrees. <laughs> yeah, probably not. Uh, very the lobster effect would happen very quick. I have a yeah, feeling. It it happens real fast. Now my wife, she would golden up and tan just fine, but I yep. would be. I'd look like I got cooked on a spit. Yep, that's that's my wife. She's the same way as you, and then I exactly. I just tan right up, no problem must be nice yeah it is <laughs> it is, it is. <laughs> <laughs> but but yeah going back to the desert i mean uh we live out there all winter long you know from basically the season starts in october when the weather starts to change and then ends about spring break and there's sand drags and um we have a there's a hill we go to called um probably slides and everybody goes there during the day and just races up and down and goes at night with all their lit whips and it's just it's a it's an awesome experience i mean the kids love it adults love it it's just like a giant sandbox and you're just on a roller coaster all day so if you're if your stomach gets uneasy real easy, you know it's probably not the best place for you to go but you know you'll you'll definitely have to get out here and i'll have to take you for the experience of it. I think you'd enjoy it. No, that'd be a great time. And nowadays, I mean, there's there's guys that just spend astronomical amounts of money on these cars. You know, you're talking 200, 300 grand in these things with 1,500 horsepower, and they're doing like 160 miles an hour through the dunes on direct, through the drags. It's just, it's cool to watch, but it's nuts. Yeah, that one would feel a little bit nuts. Yeah. I don't know if I quite need that much horsepower on the old foot. Yeah, no, might, these, that would definitely get me in trouble. Yeah, these guys are these guys are a little crazy. And the funny part is, most of them are contractors. So that's the best part. <laughs> I mean, you got to blow off steam somehow. Yeah, that's right. That's right. You know, you that's... you quite literally can't think about anything else if you're going 160, because by then the lines blur and everything else, and you just you get so zoned in and focused. That's all you can think about. You got to have some quick reaction time, definitely. My car doesn't go quite that fast, but it's fast enough for me. So, you know, yeah. Well, and then you also, I know you're a, you're a boating guy too. So what's the lake you go to out there? If you're not, if you're not on the sand lake, where's the water lake? So there's a river, actually Colorado river is about a little okay. over an hour from home and we try and hit that as much as possible in the summertime. Obviously, when we're working, you know, seven days a week, it makes it a little difficult. But we did get out there a couple weeks ago. We try and hit the big holidays like Fourth of July and Labor Day weekend. Um, it's it's called Martinez Lake where we launch or Hidden Shores, but it's actually on the Colorado River. Gotcha. Yeah, and that's that's a blast too. We we're we're big. Uh, Adrenaline junkies, I guess you could say. <laughs> well, adrenaline junkie, but you're also you just, you like you know the the peace of the outdoors. Oh, definitely, yeah. There's like I said, there's just nothing like it. You know, it's a great experience, it's, especially you, you know the river, obviously with the water. But like out of Glamis at night, you know, we sit around a campfire and everybody just BSs and drinks some beer and just you know has a good time. No, there's there's nothing better than a campfire and a few brews and good friends. Yeah. Yeah, that's exactly. That was, you know, I grew up. I grew up in the mountains, where, you know, we had to go an hour to even find something to do because we just. I was in the middle of nowhere, so I mean, most of my, most of my childhood in the summers was, you know, especially once I got older. You know, we would work during the day, and then me and the buddies were camping on the mountainside, just about every night. We had holes set up up on the top of the on the top of the mountain behind where my parents and I grew up or where I grew up with my parents. And we would just leave, you know, tent platform of the tent campfire sitting up there and just go up every day for weeks at a time. Yeah, exactly. It's like, just like here, you know, everybody, 
everybody knows we're from Southern California and they think, you know, LA or San Diego and we're like, nope, I am literally in the armpit of California, middle of nowhere, middle of the desert. <laughs> but it's great, you know, because it's, uh, it's like farmland all around us, you know, just a bunch of good old boys, farmers and contractors and everybody knows each other. So it's a good community and, you know, everything's close to us. LA is three hours, San Diego is an hour and a half. Phoenix is three. We go to Glamis, that's close. The river, there's lakes, you know, there's there's a ton of stuff around us, which is nice. But we're out of the big city life, which I like because mm -hmm. I'm born and raised here and I lived in San Diego during trade school and I I had about enough after eight months. That was good enough for me. Yep, I feel you. Yeah. So so how big is your little town? Because you're what, Holtville? Is that it? Correct? Yeah, so so I'm in, I actually live in Holtville. It's tiny. I mean, the, the population off the top of my head, I don't even know, but it's it's very minimal. Maybe like ten or 12,000. There's hardly any people okay. there. So yeah, that's yeah. that's Bryson City where I grew up was, yeah. was maybe that in the whole county. Yeah. And El Centro is, is a lot bigger. There's, there's a lot of people here but not nothing compared to you know a big city we're growing we've been growing pretty rapidly in the last 10 years but it's still small community technically well and that's always nice it's nice you can go to go to town and you see everybody you know it just it just it feels like home in a different way you know we live we live a little bit outside of charlotte we live in concord which probably the closest landmark you would probably think about is like so the Charlotte Motor Speedway is actually in yep. Concord and we live about maybe 10 minutes 15 minutes the most from the track nice yeah my, my mother-in-law lived in on in uh, Morrisville for about I don't know four or five years oh, okay right there on, on Lake Norman yep yep so one of the two branches I work out of the most is in is in Mooresville so I work out of Mooresville and Charlotte most of my time nice I got a I got a trip to Raleigh to go help the uh, counter guy there later this week, but most of my time is kind of central North Carolina. And then I've got customers that kind of start headed towards Linville Falls and Grandfather Mountain and that part up in the mountains towards Boone, and then I've got other ones downstate and all over. Yeah, it's it's beautiful out there. So you also mentioned that you fly i did not realize you fly at all now judging from your instagram handle i should have known better but i honestly had never caught that you did well i technically so there's there's a catch to that i technically don't fly i it's been on my list to get my pilot's license you know everybody's like oh you know top gun mechanical and you're a retired fighter pilot i'm like no <laughs> i wish <laughs> right i mean they would technically almost never know but yeah yeah I, I've always just been, even as a kid, like obsessed with jets. You know, when I was a kid, I was constantly doing reports on like the SR-71 Blackbird and the B-2 and F-14s. And it's just kind of, you know, not an infatuation, but just, you know, it's just like amazing the way, you know, those things operate and fire pilots and just, you know, elite, the best of the best. So Taylor, who was on the show, who's one of my customers, he was, what, episode 107, I think? Learn to Fly was the episode, just couldn't help it. Um, but mm -hmm. he's got his pilot's license. So he every now and then, it'll be like 3 o'clock in the afternoon, he'll send me a Snapchat, and he's, you know, a couple thousand feet in the air. I'm like, yeah. man, I guess I yeah. just need to own my own company. Yeah, it's, <laughs> it's an awesome experience. I've got buddies with planes, and, you know, I've always wanted to... I actually started, I, I went to go start the process right before COVID hit to get my license, and then COVID hit, and it you know, got tossed on the back burner, like everything else, you know? So, but yep. I'd, I'd actually like to get my helicopter's pilot's license as well. I have a buddy who flew forever and it's just like, dude, you know, it's just, it's a just totally different experience when you're flying. It's just, it's great. Nothing like it. No, I, I definitely agree with that. If I ever get the chance to go, at least uh, be a co-pilot. I will definitely do it. Yeah. So hey, maybe that's another trip out there. You never know. You're right. Um, there you go. <laughs> since we got, we have a lot of time to make up on. Um, so I know. I hate that we didn't run into each other in Chicago. I didn't even realize we were both 
well, I realized I was there, but I didn't realize you were there until I think we were all leaving. Um, which means I know we've got to find another conference out there, which I was, we were supposed to do iHackey last year. It just unfortunately scheduling conflicts with what we were doing for workforce development. We, we kind of had to go that route because we really wanted to do some things for those kids. Yeah. Um, but you know, what was, was that, do you go to AHR typically, or was this kind of your first one really? And you know, how was your experience and kind of, what did you take away from that? So we typically hit the eye hockey, you know, cause it's close to us. Usually yeah. AHR this year or last year was, that was my first and it was an awesome experience. It's definitely one for the schedule every year from here on out. But my brother and I, you know, kind of flew out on a whim. We, I told him, I was like, you know, let's go. And we only hit it for two days. So we were trying to cover a lot of ground, you know, in, yep. in two days. And when we do Orlando, I'll definitely, you know, pan out more on the schedule, probably closer to three or four or five days there, you know, just get the full experience a couple of days prior, maybe a day after, but we loved it. I mean, you know, it's, it's probably in my opinion, the one show where you can actually see everything, you know, prior to it coming to market. No, and that's definitely the truth. Just, uh, you know, dealing with talking with all the vendors and, and, you know, just mingling with all the people of our trades, you know, I, I, I really enjoy that. I think that the last several years, you know, the, the social media influence of, of people that go has, has changed a whole lot. And I think it's went from not only just being, you know, a cool place to see new technology, but it's, it's actually, it's becoming an even cooler experience to really get to network and know people that you in some ways talk to every day, but never actually get to spend time with. Yeah, exactly. <clears throat> and that was cool because, you know, a, a lot of guys and, or gals that I had talked to, you know, via Instagram or emails working, you know, on stuff you don't really know them in person per se. Like, you know, you, we think we know everybody yeah. through Instagram, you know, because you have a pretty good sense of, you know, friendship or relationship or, you know, customer service, whatever you want to call it. And then when you actually get to meet people in person, you know, you just kind of close the gap on that. And, and it's, it's nice to put, you know, a name to a face and, and shake hands and, you know, basically, mingle with people you know that you've been talking to for months or <laughs> maybe even years no you it's, know? it's it's the truth um yeah i remember getting to meet meet doc the first time uh-huh which because because i mean he and i talk probably almost every day mm -hmm. at this point foodie probably almost every day too hopefully yeah. he can make it to orlando um which last week's Last week's show was those two guys. It hasn't come out yet, but last week's show was those guys. Um, hopefully, he'll be able to make it to Orlando because he's been trying to get to the last two. I know we had attempted to get him virtually on a show when we were in Atlanta, and unfortunately, it just did not work. But mm -hmm. I think the one thing when I start meeting all of you guys in person is I've just really learned how short I truly am. Because I swear, everybody I meet is like a foot taller than me, especially the Canadians. I'm like, oh, hey, up there. That's funny. But I swear, like, everybody I meet, like, there's none of us that are five foot eight. Well, me and, hell, I think well, you... even Garrett's taller than me. Um, no, I'm just a little short, short, stumpy German guy. Yeah, that's how my brother is. He, you guys, you guys would probably be close to the same height. Yeah. He, he does the same thing. He's like, why is everybody so much taller than me? I'm like, uh, I don't know, dude. Sorry. <laughs> so I hide online. I look I look so much taller online. So, so much cooler <laughs> online. Is that it? Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I think I'm definitely excited to see you in Orlando. Um, I definitely need to get out to iHacky. I, I know I need to talk to those people again and about getting in the uh, their little podcast pavilion. So that's definitely on the books for the future again at some point. But what I love about doing this on this show is I really like getting people's background and letting you tell your story. Because again, we, we see each other on social media all the time, but we only see the sampling of what we know or what we think we know. So I kind of want to take it back to 
you know, how you started, you know, you said you went to San Diego to go to trade school, but you know, what sparked your interest in HVAC and, and how did you get your start? What's up, trade crew contractors? Are you looking for a line of ductless split systems that's as reliable as you are? Meet Bosch's Climate 5000 Generation 3 ductless inverter mini splits, the systems that install as smoothly as they operate. With easy setup, it's like Bosch knew you had better things to do than wrestle with complex installations. And once it's in, it's whisper quiet, energy efficient, exceptionally service friendly, and built to last, keeping your customers comfortable and your phone quiet. Plus, with Bosch's reputation backing you and your customers up, you'll look like a hero every time. So, the next time you're on a job that requires a ductless application solution, go with Bosch Climate 5000 Generation 3 Equipment, the perfect sidekick for pros who know their stuff. And now, back to the show. So I am actually second generation HVAC. My brother and I are. Okay. My, our dad's been in the trade for, you know, over 40 plus years. So I've been doing this longer than I haven't, you know, I, yep. even as a kid going to do service calls with him and, um, I really got thick in it when I was about 15, I, we had we had just started, so we have three businesses essentially. I've, I've got a contractor's license. My dad's got a contractor's license. My brother's got a contractor's license. So we're just like a big family of contractors. Yep. Um, so when we first started that first company, I was 15 and I just, okay, you know, I need a summer job. Let's, we just mm -hmm. started this business. Let's try it out, you know? So I was just a punk ass kid in my extended cab s10 you know and started at the <laughs> bottom you know just just like anybody else does and yep um i was demoing we, i i remember it like it was yesterday it's kind of crazy we were doing this project at a high school and one of the foremen his nephew needed a job too and he's like okay we got all this square duct we need a demo in this building so here you go you know here's the sawzall and snips and start taking it all down just <laughs> don't kill yourself <laughs> so that's kind of where it all began you know was was there and then um the next summer i rode with another tech where i kind of jumped into the tech side of things and um started doing that you know started running service calls and doing services and um long hours, you know, seven days a week, the company was brand new. So we were just all in the thick of it. Just, just trying to get, trying to get rolling and, um, went through high school doing that in the summer and then graduated high school and went straight into trade school. Did that for, for eight months and got back and just kept going, you know? Now when, at that time when he was starting his business, <clears throat> one, did he, you know, did he learn his trade somewhere else and then decide to start his own business? And then what was really the focus of the company at that time? Did you kind of, did you start in the commercial space or was it residential or you kind of had to do everything to get it off the ground or what was kind of the focus of, of the business as you guys started to build it initially? So my, my old man, he, he actually worked for another company throughout the, you know, mid eighties to early two thousands before he started this business and they were commercial based. I mean, they were probably the biggest in town for the longest time. You know, they had tons of guys, they did everything mainly commercial. They were known for commercial as a commercial company, but they also did residential, but they did electrical, they had crews for everything. And he actually bought into that company. And then, um, I don't know the whole details behind that backstory, but, uh, he parted ways and then, you know, started R and K air conditioning, which is essentially our family business. We're all tied in together into that one. And, gotcha. um, we've always been commercial based company on that side. That's where it started. And then when I came into the mix, um, 
we hard, we didn't do hardly any residential aside from people that we knew. You know, it was all word of mouth. Yeah. We didn't advertise yeah. it. And I was kind of the one where I was like, okay, you know, I was an 18 year old kid. We were huge trained guys then. And I spent three weeks in Tyler, Texas, did their training, you know, their no pressure sales training mm -hmm. and got back. And I really pushed the residential hard where I was like, okay, you know, we don't do any residential. I'm going to, I'm going to really boom this side of the business. And <laughs> it's kind of a funny story when I got back, you know, the first summer, you just kind of get in the feel of things. Okay. You know, I can, I can do sales now, blah, blah, blah. I'm going to sell some units. And, and I was asking him, I said, okay, you know, you know, how, how many units do I need to sell? You know, what, what, what's a good number? And <laughs> I, I, I think he was messing with me at the time. And he goes, you, you need to do a unit a day, a unit a day. And I said, okay, you know, a unit a day. All right. I, I can do that. So that first summer, you know, I, I had some pretty decent numbers then and we, you know, we were, we were starting to push it. And then by the end of that second year of actually selling residential, I hit that number. We were doing a unit a day and looking back on it now, it's kind of crazy to think, you know, these small company, small town, we're in the middle of nowhere. And even train was like, you know, you're probably like number three or number four on our numbers in Southern California. And I'm like, there's no way, you know, we're in Imperial Valley. Mm -hmm. Come on. But we, we were, I was, I was hungry and I was driven and, you know, I really boomed the residential side of that business per se. And we were a commercial based company, you know? So we were already busy on the commercial side and here we go. You got this 18 year old, 19 year old kid, you know, selling 400 units a year. And <laughs> it was kind of crazy the way it all, the way it all happened. And, um, that's really where I started was, you know, bottom of the barrel, just like anybody else, you know, it's my, my dad's very old school and he, I love him to death. He's an absolute, probably one of the smartest businessmen I know, but he's a horrible boss for the times. <laughs> I always give him, I always give him crap. I tell him, you know, you, you lead with an iron fist and it doesn't always pan out. So you need to step it back a notch, you know, but. Well, um, I, I know, I know that feeling. <clears throat> yeah. I know dad and I butted heads a lot from time to time and it, you know, it, yeah. I worked with him, you know, yeah. literally from five until I got out of college. And then I thought I would run away from HVAC, which it never works. It, it pulls you back somehow. Um, so I think all but all but nine months of my professional career, I've been at HVAC in one form or another. But you know, I, I completely get that. Sometimes it can be. Sometimes it's tough in the family business, and you know, it's it's impressive that you and your brother and your dad have all made it work because not everybody's able to really do that, even though I know you kind of have separate different business units now, but, you know, to be able to, to look back on that, it's it's impressive, man. Yeah, it's, it you know, it's a lot, and um, it's good and bad, you know? It's, it's yeah. a blessing and a curse at the same time. You just roll with it, you know, what do you do? So, yeah, we, we have, we have that one main hvac company and then my brother and i also have companies on the side i actually i've i've always you know wanted to do my own avenues of things i actually started my first business when i was 18 when i got out of trade school i started a duck testing company where i was doing hers rating you know i did that for side by side for six or seven years and then once the regulations kept changing i was like okay I, I've had enough of this, you know, I, you got to get recertified every three years and pay another couple grand mm -hmm. or whatever. It was kind of like, yeah. And then it was always, oh, I need you right now. You know, it's the last thing you do before the permit gets signed off. So it got to be a little hectic, but, um, then I started my second company, which was a powder coating shop that I owned and operated for 12 years. And I had, you know, four or five guys in the back, which obviously with all the off-road stuff we do, it was always intriguing to me so I uh, I started that company when I was 24 and recently sold it off about three years ago um, and you know then in between then and there I got my contractor's license as well so yeah it, you know everybody uses the word entrepreneur and I don't I'm not a fan of that word I just 
I don't know. If people think I'm crazy, I just like being a business owner. <laughs> I guess pulling my hair no, out is, is well, my forte. <clears throat> well, and I can't, I can't say anything. My my business degree is technically an entrepreneurial business degree, so I'll, yeah. I'll keep that to myself over here. <laughs> um, but I think so. I think that there's the difference is, and, and how I looked at it when I was in school was, you could do business management. It's like, well, that's great. You can teach me how to kind of in most cases i felt like the business management stuff unfortunately just seemed to be like this just helps you maintain the status quo and keep it where it is and make sure it's profitable but i never felt like it it was giving a lot to how to actually create the business or grow the business yes and i liked yeah. that the entrepreneurial department that i was you know at with western is in in order for those professors to actually teach they had to have been serial entrepreneurs and owned and ran businesses themselves. They couldn't just be someone that went through and got a doctorate of business and went to teach. So there were requirements of, you know, they've created and, and developed so many millions of capital in their career to even be able to have a seat as a professor. So I felt in a lot of cases I was learning from people that had figured out how to start the business, run the business, grow the business, you know, either sell the business or do something else with it. And I wanted to understand how to get from point A to point B because unfortunately my dad didn't have business training really at all. He, he kind of was a victim of, he built himself a great job and this right. is not knocking on dad, but he, he built himself a great job because he's extremely intelligent. If I had a quarter, no, actually if I had like a percent of the mechanical brain he had, I would be very dangerous. Yeah. But he just, he, he didn't have that business side of it. So there's so many things I'm sure he could have done in the years that would have put his business probably in a better place than it, than it ever got to or is. Yeah. And I, I, you know, especially nowadays it's, it's, it's like I tell people when they, you know, they ask me about, you know, owning a business or starting a business. And I, you know, I'm just tell them, you know, you're, you either have it or you don't, you know, we're, it's like, we're bred for this. It's, you know, it's, it's long hours and mm -hmm. it's very mentally draining and physically draining. And it's not what everybody thinks it is. That's for sure. You know, and, and, and like for me, you know, I'm, since I started, you know, in the nitty gritty in the bottom of it, you know, I'm a very hands-on on the tools guy. I like being in the field. I like doing the jobs and, you know, and that's where, on the other end of it, being a businessman or business owner, quote unquote, you know, I struggle on that side of it where, you, you know, there's emails to answer and phone calls to make and, you know, jobs to line up. So you're, you know, you're kind of juggling everything, I guess you could say. And, and you know, it, it, especially nowadays with finding, you know, good help and good management and good people, it, it makes it very difficult at times. Well, and I understand, you know, I understand completely the want to lead from the front because you want to give an example to these guys to be like, yes. this is how it's done. This is the pace we can do it. Yes. It's like, I want you guys to see, I'm not asking you to do something that I don't know how to do myself. And there's, yeah. you know, and, I, and that's kind of the way I approach things on the distribution side as best I can. You know, yeah. I started with a broom in my hand in a warehouse yeah. because... That was the only job I could get at the time. So I was like, well, okay, that's fine. I'll work my way up. I can do that. You yeah, know, yeah. so so I've been the warehouse guy. I've been the counter guy. I've been a driver. I've been all those things before I ever got to sales. So I don't ever feel guilty ever about asking a driver or a warehouse person or an inside sales person to do anything because, look, I've done it too. I said, if you want me to come show you how to do it faster, I'll come show you. I don't mind. Yeah. I said, but, uh -huh. you know, I'm never going to ask someone that, works with me to do something that I'm not, you know, willing to do myself. But you also, unfortunately, as you go up the chain, you've got to learn and understand how to delegate so that you can lead from the front and give example while still having the time to do the things in the back office that you've got to do in order to have the opportunity to even lead from the front. And it's that balance is difficult on both sides, irregardless of, of any of it. 100%. 100%. And I feel like that's why my guys and I have such a good mutual respect for each other because they know that, okay, if we're going to do this and Ryan's asking us to do it, he is going to be in that trench with me side by side, probably doing it twice as long as I am, you know, because I, I try and obviously summertime is crazy and everybody's working long hours and 
you know, we still, you know, I try and be lenient on, you know, when, you know, you can tell, you know, all the guys have, have, have been with us a very long time and, you know, when your guys are, you know, maxed out and you're like, okay, you know, it's time to call it quits, go home. And yep. I just feel like when you're in it with them, it adds, you know, a much higher respect between each other just because, you know, mentally they know, okay, you know, he's not just here, here you go. You know, we got 2000 feet of pipe to run and it's 120 degrees outside. I'm going to go sit in my office and watch TV or, you know, whatever the yeah. case may be. So, and I feel like, um, being on the tools is, you know, it, it's good as well. You know, I, I have a lot of guys that ask, you know, where, where, where do you start? You know, what, what, where should I start doing? I actually just hired an apprentice yesterday and young kid, he's in his second year of trade school. And, you know, I said, you're, you're going to ride with me. And he's kind of, you know, like, what do you mean? And I said, you're going to go with me. I do what you do. You know, you have to yep. start and you got to figure it out. You know, the more you know about installing the equipment and how the equipment works and when it breaks, how to fix it, the more you're going to know on the back end too, when you're doing a bid and okay, I know this is going to take a week or two hours or whatever the case may be, you know? So it's, I feel like it's good to be, you know, well-rounded and, and know your trade. Well, and that's, I completely agree with that because in a lot of cases, that's what I feel and in, in a lot of instances I feel it's what sets me apart from from most sales guys is a lot of times you've got sales guys you've got sales engineers that they can sit down and they can build a schedule and they can look at different things but they've never actually went and laid eyes on it at all yeah. or they've never they're there to it. sell yeah. they're there to sell mm -hmm. and I you know I'm here to sell too but I also enjoy the challenge of helping somebody solve a problem yeah, you're also here to educate, you know, and yep. and I feel like a lot of that kind of got lost maybe about 10 years ago where, you know, dealing dealing with guys early on, kind of the old, you know, I call them old timers, but, you know, the guys that were probably on their way out because, you know, they were doing it through the 80s and 90s, you know, they did everything by pen and paper and they were, mm -hmm. they, they knew their equipment, you know, they, they, could, they could read a submittal to you without even looking at it and it was just yep. mind blowing. And now, you know, half the time you ask a guy for something, well, I don't know. And I'm like, well, how do you not know? You know, this is your equipment. What do you mean you don't know? <laughs> I know that feeling. I'm going, I'm going through the I don't knows right now because we just, where I work at Insight, we just became the Green Heck reps for the Carolinas. Wow. And, nice. But it's, it's literally drinking out of a fire hose at the time of year that you're already drinking out of a fire hose. Oh, yeah. Um, I can imagine. And, and trying to learn, learn and build the stuff and their software and, and everything else. Even with the schedule, you know, the engineer lays it out and he's got a specific model, but it, it takes a little bit of understanding of how to actually build the model to yes. get in there and get everything right get the pricing done get the cut sheets, submittals, all that stuff done. And, you know, I, most of all my experience was residential, true light commercial. Um, mm -hmm. but one of the biggest reasons I moved to this company, you know, just over a year and a half ago was because it gave me the opportunity to really learn all of the other stuff on the commercial side of the business because yes. I hadn't had exposure to that in distribution before. So I still get to do, you know, a lot of the things that I understand and know and what made me be successful where I was in the past, but now I'm starting to try to add all these other, you know, tools into the toolbox. Right. Because and at the end of the day. I want to be able to go run a circle around a regular distribution rep and a commercial rep and be like, well, I can do it both. Yes. And that's the thing that separates you from the others because you're willing to learn and you want to learn, you know, you want to educate where, you know, most people don't. Well, it's funny in, in the episode with Jessica that came out last week from global, mm -hmm. um, we had that one spot in the show that, still got to cut it out but we we literally talked about one of the things that sets any salesperson apart is when they can understand how to sell with the heart of a teacher yes because our first and foremost thing we have to do is educate our customer our potential customer about what we actually have to offer but if you don't know your product and you don't know you really don't know your own strengths or your company's strengths how can you expect to go out and build a customer base of educated customers that are going to be 
coming back to you time and time again. You have to set a precedent of, you know, an expert in what you do. And, yeah. you know, and sometimes there's a little bit of fake it till you make it from time to time when you first start out. But if you can understand where to go find the information, that can almost make you just as valuable as already having it in your head. 100%. And yeah, of course, you know, n nobody knows everything. And if they think they do, they don't know shit, in my opinion, you know, but yeah. that's it's just it. It's, it's, it's about learning. You know, everyone's always learning and everybody's always, you know, trying to get educated. And especially in this trade, you know, it's, it's changing so fast. It's, it's absolutely nuts. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I never thought we would see as many changes in the last couple of years as we've seen, but it just, it just keeps going and going and going. Yeah. It's nuts people just like to regulate man i guess you know it, it's it, yeah it, it'd be nice if it would slow down a little bit sometimes you know i feel like we i feel like we just rolled out r22 and here we are with this a2l so. <laughs> <laughs> so you were building we'll go back a little bit you know you're building this residential division now at what point you know did did that maintain or did did someone else start to take over residential or did you kind of just keep that going for a while or how did you start to transition from that into, you know, from just sales and technician into even the idea that you wanted to start your own business as well on the HVAC side outside of what you've done out of the trade? So I've always loved the commercial side. I mean, you know, even early on when, like I said, when my, my old man was doing it, you know, back in the eighties and nineties, that's what they did, you know, all the big stuff. And it's, that's, that is what I really enjoy doing. You know, I was a young kid when I first started. So obviously you, you know, you go after the low hanging fruit and okay, you know, I can, I can figure out residential, you know, commercial scares everybody, you know, and it scared me too, you know, as an 18, 19 year old kid, you know, I didn't know what I was doing. So I kind of stayed away from, from that side of it for a while and, uh, focused on residential for, for, you know, I don't know, maybe four or five years. And, uh, my brother kind of came into the mix after he graduated high school and he's actually a, uh, certified chef and then got, you know, sucked into being an HVAC <laughs> guy with us. <laughs> I've got a customer with a culinary degree. I know exactly what you're yeah. So once my brother kind of rolled in too, you know, I kind of, I don't want to say I pushed the residential stuff on him, but you know, I, I said, okay, you know, you, you can do this. And we always, you know, we've always done everything where we've done commercial and residential and service work and refrigeration. And, you know, we, we have our own crane or crane operators and, um, you can't juggle everything, you know? So I, I really, I probably jumped hot and heavy into the commercial side about 10 years ago, I would say. And, um, once I got in and really got a grasp on it and, you know, really looking at blueprints a lot more and plans and, and scheduling and I just, it clicked. I was like, this is, this is my shit right here. This is what I really enjoy doing. And, um, I mean, you know, let's be honest, the big stuff like that is sexy. You know, everybody loves seeing all the big stuff and the 60 ton units <laughs> and the BRF. And it's like, yeah, it's, it's great, you know, and, but it's a lot of work, you know, it's, it's a lot of back end stuff and a lot of, a lot of prep, a lot of scheduling and, um, making sure your guys are educated, especially, you know, as you know, I do a lot of BRF. That's kind of my thing. And yep. we were actually the first contractor kind of in this portion of Southern California to bring BRF in. So, okay. So that makes, that makes some sense why that was one thing that kind of has helped yeah. fuel that specialization. That's where it all started. The very first job I did that was BRF was an actual bank where they were doing a remodel and it was a Fujitsu. And, uh, that was my first BRF job. And, you know, it just, going through and it was new it was new to me it was new to everybody you know so going through the changes and trying to figure out how the system worked and you know the different type of shielded wire you had to use and the whys and you know you can't do this you can't do that and it was it was challenging but i liked it you know i like a challenge so it was kind of it kind of exactly it kind of just you know fueled my fire where i was like okay you know i i can do this i like i like this side of the 
of the industry where it's, you know, everybody was afraid of it because, oh, inverter, you know, you can't get parts or, you know, they're too fancy. No one knows how to work on them. Well, yes, they are, you know, a high end piece of equipment, but once you educate yourself and figure them out, it's not as scary as they look, in my opinion. I remember, <clears throat> I remember the first time I worked on a mini split, which I will say, my dad and old Cajun Joe has always been, you know, he wants to put in the best of the coolest new stuff out there. He wants to know how it works. Yeah. Um, so, you know, he was, when I even first remember inverter stuff coming out, like he was all over it immediately. So he was like, yeah, this, this, this changes so much. He's like, we gotta know how to do this. We gotta know how to do this. I think I remember the first, ironically, the first, um, mini split training classes I ever went to were, were Fujitsu for years because we sold that from I would say around 2004 2005 through oh geez I think he put Fujitsu in for probably a decade plus we sprinkled some dike in here and there which that was prior to you know the Goodman involvement um I feel like I liked the name better before then sorry dike and <laughs> Goodman guys sorry um because before that you know, anytime we heard someone talk about Daikin as a mini split, it was a Cadillac. You know, I mean, yes. that was just it's like, you can't beat it. You know, it's like it's from overseas, it's tried and tested. And, you know, this is this is the way you got to go. And then I remember when that um, purchase and transition happened, I was like, I feel like that's that just hurt them in my own mind. Yeah. Um, but I digress. Well, I think on everybody that went through that, you know, because it was kind of a name that was unheard of, at, you know, during that yep. time. Yep. Everybody knew Goodman, but, you know, it's like, what's Daikin, you know? And come to now, it's like they're the biggest HVAC manufacturer in the world. It's crazy, you know? Yep. Um, but yeah, I remember, I remember Fujitsu for years and then um, sold Gree for, for several years, sold LG time to time. Um, and then, you know, I've sold Bosch for, for a good bit now, but we never got into a full VRF system, like big, big one. I think the most, the most I ever dealt with was just maybe six heads. So it was two yeah. branch boxes at that. I never yeah. got into any big, big VRF stuff. So it's always been kind of fascinating to watch how, how guys even put that stuff together. It's pretty slick. Yeah. It, and it, it's funny you say that because when going back to what you said about your dad, you know, and, uh, you know, installing the best, that was, that was kind of what clicked in my head when I did that first job. And I, it was kind of funny because I was telling my guys and everybody, they're like, Oh, you're doing, you know, a VRF system. I said, yeah, I said, this is going to be next. This is, this is what's coming next for the world to see from here on out. Oh no, you're crazy. You know, they're too far advanced. I said, no, this is, I'm telling you, this is going to be what's next. So I don't know if just, Thinking that in my own head, you know, it really pushed me to, you know, get educated on it and figure it out, I guess you could say. And look at now, you know, we're we're basically putting a VRF system in every building I possibly can at this point. We call them the chiller killers. <laughs> the chiller killers. Well, and, and and in some ways that's true. So let's, I know we, let's go, let's talk about, let's just focus on VRF for just a little bit. So, you know. What would you say you enjoy the most about designing and installing VRF? I think it's the the capability of it. You know, we, we just got done with that big medical facility and it originally was all drawn up as five ton split systems. And I told the doctor who owns the building, I said, is that really what you want? He goes, well, what do you mean? I said, wouldn't you love to have essentially not every room in your building, but you know, say 75% of your building to have total control in different areas. He goes, well, what do you mean? I said, you know, we could put as many zones as you want. We won't design it that way, but you know, you could have your front lobby at 70 degrees. And I know you like your office at 80 and it's totally capable. He goes, well, there's no way. How can we do that? And I said, mm -hmm. it's VRF, you know, cause you don't like it cold, but obviously someone walking in from 110 degrees outside wants to come into a nice cool building. I said, and that's a hundred percent doable with VRF. I said, but that's not just it. You know, you can, 
the office next to you could be at 72 degrees and the one behind you could be at 90 in heat if you want. He goes, well, you know, how's that even possible? You know, well, then you throw heat recovery into the mix and, Mm -hmm. you know, down here, especially uh, in the winter months, you know, a, a west west side of a building in the morning is always warm because obviously the sun's hitting it. So put that one in cool and then your other side of your building can be in heat because that side of the building is cold. And, you know, just just the variety of what we're capable of with VRF is what I really like about it. You know, all the different air handlers and high static and we could do wall mounts for IT rooms and it's all piped to the same system. Not to mention the redundancy of it, you know. When we design a building, I try and I always try and create redundancy where uh, like this building specifically, I had, you know, two VRF systems for upstairs and two for downstairs. Well, that building was so over-engineered because the designer was at a Phoenix, the mechanical engineer, and he wanted to design it at 118 ambient. And I was like, that's crazy. You know, why, why would you do that? That's not even spec typically it's like 105 or 108 he goes no your guys's hottest temp is 120 so i want to design it at 118 degrees okay well long story short i'm glad he did because when we went to go start up that building one of the units wouldn't start up Ooh. so we had it so we yeah, had it's a brand brand new, out there we had a brand new vrf system that i couldn't run on you know one side of the building but since the building was essentially you know way overcooled no yep, one even yep. knew it you know obviously the owners and i knew it because we were trying to work out some bugs out of the system but the building was still cruising along right at 75 degrees and never skipped a beat which, which if that which didn't sell that guy on vrf i don't know what would it was it was kind of amazing to me to be honest because i was sweating it like oh man you know we, we got to get this building up and going but you know we're, we, we're having issues with this unit and we can't get them down here for a week or two and okay we're gonna run the other three and you were just gonna crank them down a little more nobody even knew that there was a system down in the building there was a couple of rooms don't get me wrong that you know were a few degrees warmer yeah but if you walked into that building and i told you there's 40 tons not cooling this place right now you would have never yeah, even known know what they would have thought it that's crazy and that's a yeah. and i'm like you say 40 tons i'm like ooh, that's, that's a big a number yeah. <laughs> exactly. yeah that's that's a lot of cooling so yeah so what are some common challenges that you encounter with with vrf installation and design and kind of what do you do to to kind of think outside of the box to overcome those um you know when we now we, we had some challenges early on, obviously, because it was it was new to everyone. But now that the guys are all kind of seasoned on it, we you hope to eliminate those, I and mean, we've eliminated a lot of those. But um, the branch boxes was kind of an issue at first, where you know if you don't have a guy that's a well seasoned guy in piping, they pipe them wrong. You know, where <laughs> you get a liquid line on port number one that really goes to port number three because they sit you know yep. one's on top of each other one's below each other you know so you go and pressurize and you're doing you know valve check and it's like well that's not right why don't we have pressure on the back end of this one and that's one of the issues that we have commonly ran into because i i typically try and and hire newer green guys that are coming in as techs and during the winter months, when they're not busy, I roll them over to the construction site to where they can kind of get a feel for the install of the equipment rather than just yep. working on it. And these guys are savvy on, you know, soldering and press. And But when you get down to following a plan and, okay, you know, these two pipes have to go to these two ports. Well, when you're looking at a branch box with, you know, 20 ports on it, 40 ports or whatever you want to call it, you know, you get lost a little bit in it. And that was probably one issue we we have noticed more than than less but it's the systems themselves in my opinion are actually pretty straightforward and if you follow protocol like you're supposed to and and you know install them like any other air conditioner you're supposed to install use nitrogen and you know it it makes the longevity of the system just that much better 
and use nitrogen what are you talking about yeah right yeah <laughs> well that was the thing when you tell people that they get a 10-year warranty on a commercial piece of equipment they're like how's that even possible well they're so strict on you know the install spec that if you actually follow it you should actually get a whole lot longer life than that out of the equipment with no issues and to be honest the the ones that we did install early on and now it's you know been 10 years later with very minimal issues is really impressive now the big thing you know which and it still is you know most people still are, are everything's flares in in any sort of mini split or especially in vrf it's just flare fitting flare fitting flare fitting in most cases but i know you've started to embrace kind of newer technology i know we talked a little bit about um the rls girls earlier but you know that's become a big part of your workflow now and you know how has that you know actually helped improve in the long run you know even just every individual joint but how has it sped up the process of installation for you and your guys you know going press, to press is, from flare press has been huge for us i mean especially on on you know large commercial side you get a you, you you've got so many people on the fence with 50 50 oh it leaks it's junk it doesn't work and then you got guys like me that absolutely love it you know a lot of time people are thinking oh you know these these fittings cost so much more and, da, da, da. and it's like okay if, if you're looking at it from you know one weld to one fitting obviously yeah it's going to be a little more but i'm looking at it with hundreds of fittings or thousands of mm -hmm. fittings where if I've got to go through a building and braze, you know, 400 joints, it's going to take us forever. You know, if I go through and press 400 fittings, it's going to happen pretty rapidly. You know, yep. there's still prep involved like anything else, but yep. so when we originally got into the whole press thing, uh, that, so that, uh, that bank job I was telling you about, that was our first VRF. They told us, I had already kind of done research on press and, and fittings that were coming out. And there was another brand that they would only let us use. And it was, I won't even mention it, but it was horrible. <laughs> Absolutely horrible. We had tons of leaks and it was a you know totally different design. There was like these brass inserts and it, it was six pieces to a fitting. It was a mess. And that was the only thing they would let us use. So I said, okay, we'll try it. And I, yeah, that was a big mistake. But I, you know, it didn't turn me off to press. I was like, no, you know, there's then zoom lock, which is yeah, what it was. kinks to work out. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and so zoom lock rolled out and I saw it and I was like, okay, you know, this is, this looks pretty legit, you know? So I've actually probably been using press for, you know, that, with that first brand of fittings, it was 10 years ago, but rolling into when I swapped over to zoom lock, you know, we've been probably using that for, you know, seven, eight years now. And I did a job where my brother and I were going to a project in Beaumont, which is in, outside of Palm desert. And it was tilt up building with like 40 split systems on it or something crazy. And we were only doing a section of it. We were, they were doing the tilt up and, and I think our portion was like 10 split systems, but it was a lot of pipe, it, you know, it was building was five stories tall or something. And I said, okay, you know, we're going to, we're going to buy this tool and, and we're going to use it on this job. So I had calculated it out where I was like, all right, you know, me and you could go through, it was 300 fittings. I was like, it would probably take us like three weeks, four weeks just to do the fittings, you know, put all <laughs> the fittings in place, braze them, pressurize, check, blah, blah, blah. Okay. So I said, we're not going to do that. And he kind of looked, well, you know, what are we, what are we going to do? I said, we're going to press them. Well, okay. So we bought the tool, bought all the fittings and we went through and did 300 fittings and pressed them in about four days, him and I. Ooh. Yeah. Think so, about the labor cost savings yes. there. So and that's, look at, that's what you got to get them to look at. Yes. And that's really where I try and, you know, tell people to look at the big picture, you know? Yeah. I mean, 
not everybody is doing, you know, 400 fittings on a job. I get that. But like for us, just in labor savings alone, it was, you're talking, you know, two weeks of two guys labor savings, not to mention they don't got to sit in a hotel for another two weeks away from their families out, you know, not at home, but it's, it's, it's just huge. You know, it on large scale, you just can't compare. You can't even the fittings, co okay. The fittings cost more and you got to buy this, you know, tool worth, you know, four or five grand or whatever. Okay. You know, the tool essentially pays for itself in your first couple of jobs. Mm -hmm. And then after that, it's just, as long as everything's prepped right, you have zero issues with press. I absolutely love it. What's up, trade crew? Are you tired of playing microfarad hide and seek with your service truck inventory? I think it's time that you tested out the Turbo 200 family from Amred Manufacturing and Global to Source where efficiency meets durability and finding the right capacitor is never a game of chance. With the Turbo family of universal capacitors, you're not just getting any regular capacitor. No, no, no. You're getting the HVAC Industries version of a superhero cape. Reliable, efficient, ready to save the day, these ruggedly tested made in the USA capacitors are prepared for whatever you run into during your service calls. These truly unique and industry-changing universal capacitors allow you to replace over 200 individual sizes with just their four models, the Turbo 200, Turbo 200X, Turbo Mini, and Turbo Mini Oval. And did I mention they have a five-year warranty? Seriously, what are you waiting for? Do the math and upgrade your truck stock setup today because the Turbo family has got you covered. Visit the HVAC R&D Vendor Hub and click on the Global Source link to request training from a local account executive in your market. Easy peasy. Amrad Manufacturing, where performance meets perfection. Because in the world of HVAC, good enough isn't in our vocabulary. It's turbo or nothing. And now, back to the show. So, I think one of the, the biggest hot topics with VRF going forward is, I you know, there's constant discussion of how they're going to handle A2L regulation. Yeah. Which I know you guys get an extra you get an extra year without having to, to change some of those things with sensors, but yep. how do you think or where do you see it kind of heading over the next couple of years with these additional regulations that are getting rolled into it? Do you think you know, do you think it's going to I hate to say it, but do you think it's gonna kinda of stump a little bit of VRF growth and maybe see a few things go back to water and chillers, or what do you think? I don't know that it'll stunt it, but it's definitely going to be a big concern. You know, they, they already have a big issue with VRF because it does require so much refrigerant to operate. Mm -hmm. You know, they, they calculate, you know, square footage per pound of refrigerant that can be in, you know, a room at any given time. And, um, A2L is really going to change that because it's, it's going to make it even worse as far as you know, that data. And if you do have a leak and that's going into a building with people occupying it, you know, what, what is protocol with that, you know? So I don't know that it'll stunt the growth of VRF, but it, it, it's, it's definitely going to shake it up a little bit. That's for sure. So talking of other shakeups, you know, obviously that's going to affect every other type of equipment out there, such as your big commercial rooftops. So I know that's kind of another big, you know, love of what you do, especially I didn't know you guys owned your own crane. I do know you're oh, yeah. a big fan of, of flying a unit. Um, <laughs> there's whole, but, there's a whole nother side to that. Yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> so I guess I would say, when was the first time you got to, you know, experience, you know, really flying rooftops and being a big part of the job once you took off on your commercial journey um, and what kind of, what gave you your first love and appreciation of that besides, you know, the family background of, of what you'd been doing? Um, as far as on the crane side or in, in general, like you know, in the, general. Big, the big rooftop sweep where you're changing them all, you got the crane out there, you know, the first big job that was yours and truly yours. You know, we, we've always really focused on a lot of schools, which obviously are a lot of RTUs and, and, uh, I would say, I think I was, 
I was probably 21 when I got my like first, okay, you know, I did this job, it's commercial, I got it. You know, it was, it was the best feeling in the world when, you know, you, you land a project you're hungry to get and, you know, working on. But, um, I don't know, you know, it's, it's hard to say what, where the commercial side started. Cause we've, we've always been so meshed in, in a bunch of different things. And it's kind of funny now because I'm, I'm rapidly trying to cut back on <laughs> residential, <laughs> but, <laughs> um, which now, you, Grant, know, you guys still do a lot of residential packs on roofs out there. At least I know they, they seem to in, in Arizona. I know they do in Nevada. I've seen a boatload of them any time oh, yeah. I've went out to Nevada. So, so, I mean, you're yeah. still, you know, you're still doing a lift even on the residential house, which I still think it's crazy to put packaging in on a roof of a residential house, but I get it. Oh yeah. Cause no one's we got have, crawl we spaces. Have, we have a ton. We have a ton of package units down here. They're everywhere. Probably probably more dominantly than split systems. You know, they're doing a lot of split systems in the, new, in the newer homes. Yep. But yeah, we, we have a lot of package units down here. Now, do you see swamp coolers and stuff at all where you are too? At all? No, we don't We don't have any swamp coolers. That's just more of an Arizona thing. Gotcha. Yeah. So what would you say, I guess, we'll ask the, the, the flying commercial question differently. What would you say is the most challenging rooftop change out you've had to deal with recently i'm glad you said that because i was actually going to say you know the the one job that really sticks in my brain is the high school that I, I that i went to school at we did a project over there where we actually didn't use our crane because we had these huge 100 ton package units we were putting on an auditorium so we had to call in this crane out of san diego and this thing was amazing it was a monster i mean it came in with two semi trucks full of counterweights and rigging and crews and guys it we had that thing maxed out and even the crane operator was kind of like this is all i got dude like i am maxed out we're trying to lift these 100 ton package units on top of this give her all she's got captain <laughs> yeah on top of this auditorium and i mean i think we were like four feet short and he's like, that's all I got. And his, this crane was just, I mean, if I have drone footage of it, I'll have to find it, but it was absolutely amazing. I mean, you're talking, you know, like over 200 foot of stick on this thing and just an absolute Jeez. beast. And these units were monsters. They were probably the length of a semi truck. And just to, you know, we're stringing these things out six stories in the air, trying to get them on top of this auditorium. And we were literally like three foot short. And the guy's like, what do you want to do? I said, we're going to push it. We're going to get it on this curb. <laughs> we're going to push it. <laughs> Give yeah. us some slack. Yeah. And about 20 people. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's probably the most memorable um, one that I have to date, you know, as far as sending, you know, flying units on roofs. That one was pretty cool. That That was one for the books for sure. Now is that now are those the biggest package units you've ever dealt with, or have you done any bigger? Just any no, yeah, bigger? those yeah, those were definitely the biggest package units we've dealt with to date. Nice. Yeah, so they were monsters. I think the next question is, you know, you talked about you know things like press have helped you, you know, change logistics and and manage costs and different things on the VRF side, but when you're looking at technical demands of you know let's say a rooftop clearing you know with all the different angles you may have to take with with cranes and everything else you mm -hmm. know what are some kind of things that you've learned over time to help manage the log logistics of that you know do you do you do everything that's going to take this certain crane we're going to do it this week and then if it takes a different type of crane do all those next week or how do you manage that yeah so anything that i can reach with our crane obviously we we utilize but there's a lot of times where we'll have you know two sometimes even three cranes on site where okay we can set all this close stuff with ours but we need i call him the big dog he's a buddy of mine the big dog to you know <laughs> to, to set all the to set all the farther stuff and you know be being in it the the longer you're in it the the more you realize that um, the prep and the scheduling and, you know, laying everything out just helps you so much on the back end. Um, 
we just recently, I'm, I'm just about wrapped up with, with another high school where we did 97 units over there. And um, just having everything set in place, you know, we, we were doing just load after load after load, it felt like over to the site. And I, I stage everything prior to when we're going on site. So it goes smooth, it flows well, you know, you don't, nobody's really rushing. You don't have guys getting hurt and staging is everything in my opinion, you know? So there was five, six package units per building. So I would go over, set up six of the curve adapters, set up six of the package units per building. And we essentially, okay, today we're going to do, not to mention that, you know, when, when you are staged, your, your work is a hell of a lot more efficient too. Mm Mm-hmm. So we, you know, we would pull up and the guys would know, okay, we're going to knock out three buildings today, which was 15 units. And we didn't finish them obviously, but we were able to pull the old units, set the new curb adapter, set the new package units. And then, you know, we'd fall back the next day to, to do electrical yep. and drainings. But, um, yeah, for me, staging just makes your life so much easier. And I, I've learned that the hard way, to be honest, you know, when you're, young and dumb and you think you know it all you know oh, i you know i got this you know i can wing it and no it it eventually bites you in the ass <laughs> so i've i've definitely learned that you know being prepared and uh, that's one thing that i would say my dad would always tell me early on as a kid you know you need to make sure you're prepared for the for the following day you know don't don't set up the, that morning you need to be prepared the day before and you know like any other guy that isn't you know working for his old man or whatever oh yeah whatever you know you're old you don't know what you're talking about you you, you learn as you get older they they do know what they're talking about you know and, and you kind of take those bits and pieces as you go and, and get a little older in life so being prepared well, in state to me is is huge on the crane side well i think you know everybody says the fortune is in the follow-up yeah but i also say the profit is in the preparation yes 100 percent um and when, you know, when you guys are doing prep of that, now, do you have, like, yeah. your own semis and box trucks? Is that how you manage getting that to to the job no, site? Or do you outsource, you know, 53-footers to load up with what you can and get it over there? Oh, I've got a lot of flatbed, not a lot, but I've got a couple flatbed deck over trailers that there use the crap where I can get, I can stack 10 units on one trailer at a time, so... If I can get twenty units to a site at a time, then I'm I'm feeling pretty good. No, that's impressive. Yeah, yeah. We, my brother and I are are uh, tag team in a dealership, two dealerships actually here next week, and <laughs> we're gonna we're gonna stage Thursday and Friday over there. We're fourteen units per dealership, and we're gonna go over there and stage everything out, set the curb adapters in place, set the units in place, and that way when when Mr. Big Dog shows up, he he loves working with us. You know, when he shows up, you know it's not it's not a mess. We're we're as organized as we can be. Nobody's perfect, but you know he knows that when he shows up, that you know we're getting in and getting out essentially. So we'll go kind of to the next thing. I know you seem to like a lot are your HVLS fans. Yes. So where did, where did that side of it come from? Was that something else that, you know, your dad had done in the past or as these things kind of became more prominent, did you just, since, you know, you went after VRF because no one else was doing it. Is that kind of the same philosophy that led you toward, you know, HVLS and some of your different ventilation projects? Yes. So that was kind of my thing, like on the VRF side where I've always, you know, for one thing, I love a good business name, so it doesn't get any better than Big Ass. <laughs> and then their marketing is like top notch, you know. But we, I, I have installed others as well, and I do like them too, you know. But it, it kind of came into play when we were doing some car dealerships, and they wanted to move air in the shop without having to condition it. And I said, you know, have you guys heard of these big ass fans? And they're like, well, no, you know, what are they? And <laughs> So we did those and, you know, their whole statement is, you know, oh yeah, you know, our fan will make your place feel 10 degrees cooler. And it really does, in my opinion, you know, and even with no air conditioning, just moving air 
yep. throughout a space is is huge. So I do them a lot on, you know, car dealerships, where you know, shipping warehouses, stuff like that. And now it, down here, a huge thing is for guys to air condition their home metal buildings, their shops. You know, yep. I won't even look at conditioning a building unless we're putting a big ass fan in. Well, and it, and it makes more sense because, you know, some of those shops are, are not taking huge, huge tonnage. And a yes. lot of it, you may only be able to, if you, you know, if you're putting packs on the ground, you don't want to have to duck up so high if this is, you know, a 20, 30 foot tall building. But if you've exactly. got something that's moving and pushing that hot air back down and keeping it circulating, it helps you, it helps condition it easier with less tonnage of, of equipment, essentially. One. 100%. I, I, uh, I have a friend who's more of like a mentor. He's, he's an older gentleman and he's a CNC machinist. And I, I actually went to high school with his son and daughter and, you know, he's been working on this metal building at his house for the last four years. And he said, you know, I, I really want to air condition it. I said, okay. He says, but I don't like ducting. I don't want any ducting on it. I said, perfect. He goes, well, what do you mean? I said, we're not going to put any ducting on it. And he kind of looked at me like I was crazy. And he goes, well, mm -hmm. what are we going to do? I said, we're going to put a big ass fan in. And he goes, well, that's not going to be enough. I said, I will guarantee you that your 5,000 square foot building with this tonnage on here, you could put it down to 72 degrees and 120. And he was like, oh, you're, you're crazy. You know, what are you talking you're about? Like, Challenge accepted, <laughs> buddy. I said, okay. So we, you know, I, I went through and I, I did the big ass fan this winter. And then I set all the package units in place right before summer, got all the ducting done and we fired that baby off and no ducting. It's the ducting literally goes up the building, out the exterior and stubs through the wall. That's it. Mm -hmm. He's like, well, how are you to move the air? I said, that fan is going to move your air. He says, there's no way. I said, it will believe me. It's going to draw that air in and your shop, you could you could leave it at 72 all day long if you wanted to so i got everything up and running right before summer hit and i hadn't really chatted it up and i called him i think it was the first week of july we had just peaked about 118. i said hey rich what are you doing oh you know just standing in my shop i said yeah what's the temp in there 75 degrees <laughs> he says i couldn't <laughs> believe it it's 118 outside and these things haven't skipped a beat he says they don't even move up a degree I, he said it's amazing to me the way you were able to design this with a big ass fan with no ducting and we're able to pull 75 72 whatever i want in here no questions asked and you know you're talking 26 you know foot ceilings in there well and that's you know I'll say one of the things that, that my dad stressed on me so much when I was even learning duct design was he said, you have to understand how air is going to work. Yes. He said, you everything. can, yeah. If, if you don't understand how the air is going to work and how the air is going to react, he said, you might as well just not even bother trying to design anything. Just put a bunch of flex on a box, which a lot of people do. Um, but if you don't understand how your air is going to flow, you can't understand why you're doing what you're doing. And I know, and it, and it comes down the same thing. I, I see duct work all the time where they don't leave space for the air to create an air dam and everything deadheads. And they wonder why they're struggling to get air to this room or that room. And I said, because you didn't allow the air to flow. Yep. It's gotta just go cause somewhere. you have, just cause there's somewhere that it can go. doesn't mean it's going to go there. Nope. You have to, you gotta gently nudge it to go. Little help. To go. Yeah, they need a little help, yeah. So being able to to take even some of that out and go to something like an HVLS fan, I think is has changed how how a lot of people can design. It's pretty awesome hearing the stories like that. What would you say would probably do you have anything that was kind of a huge challenge? You know, besides, you know, the challenge accepted that I'm gonna show you it can do this, but <laughs> You know, if you had, you know, a situation where you're like, I think this can work, but can I get a fan big enough or a fan, an HVLS fan that's small enough? Or, you know, if you struggled trying to find what you needed to do any of your jobs. That, that is uh, one concern, you know, on, on a lot of these metal buildings is, you know, either you know, the fans are the same. You have to size them accordingly where, mm -hmm. you know, and I had a guy once that, you know, he put this massive fan 
HVLS fan in his shop and it was starving. And he's like, you know, I just can't feel the air. It's not moving. And I said, yeah, the, the fan's too big. Well, what do you mean the fan's too big? I said, you know, the, these have to be sized by your height, your square footage. I said, you put a fan in here that's way too big for the space. <laughs> no, that can't be possible. You know, bigger is better. And I said, no, it's not, you know? No, it's not. <laughs> we actually had to, I had to go in and <laughs> remove his $8,000 fan he just installed and put in a smaller one because it was way oversized, you know? And I would say the biggest, the biggest battle with, with the fans a lot of time is, is space. You know, everybody likes, everybody sees them now and they want this huge, massive fan, you know, in their yep. garage or shop or whatever. And now there's, you know, now they're so well, well rounded where they essentially make something for everything. But, you know, 10 years ago they didn't, you know, they only had a few options and, and space was an issue where we were, you know, dropping the stems on these things down six feet just to clear the beams. And, you know, obviously you need clearance. And so you aren't starving a fan, but that was probably uh, a big struggle years ago was, you know, getting these things to fit in these spaces. Well, and that's one thing I've heard time and time again, you know, from people you know, in the past they could only get, you know, a four foot beam or six foot beam. And I know I just looked at a set of plans today. That's got a 14 foot fan with a 10 foot beam. Mm -hmm. Um, and this is all stuff that I'm, I'm learning too, which is why a lot of these questions are really, these are my questions for you for multiple reasons. Well, I'm no um, engineer, so, <laughs> but, but it's the concept. I'm no engineer either. Um, yeah. and there's a lot of people that have engineer in their title that couldn't, you know, Definitely use a crescent sure. wrench yeah. to get their yeah. self out of a paper bag. Yeah. But <laughs> don't, you, don't you love that? When the architects here, I want you to slam this 20 inch duct through this 12 inch gap. Okay. <laughs> yeah, you got it. It's not going to affect anything. Mm -hmm. Or, you know, uh, you see all these houses that are just I beam, I beam, I beam. Like, where the uh, hell do you want me to put this, man? Yeah. Yeah. You know, then you're going to VRF whether you want to or not. Um, yeah. Or, or anything like that. So, you know, what would be, what would be your advice for guys that want to start learning HVLS? What's, what's kind of the, the, the place really to start aside from understanding how your air operates, but to start learning how to incorporate that into something that their business is doing. You know what I, what I really did. Um, and I do a lot still now is I really try and lean on the engineers of that company, you know, where I'll ask them, Hey, you know, I'll, I'll send them over a spec or even a drawing. If I have the building, you know, what, what do you recommend here? And I try and lean on them on a lot of that stuff, because obviously it's, it's their product. It's what they sell. It's what they design. It's what they do. Um, so, you know, you can never ask enough questions in my opinion. A lot of people, you know, think, Oh, you know, I don't want to sound dumb by asking a question, but ask questions. That's, mm -hmm. that's a biggie, especially with these things. I really do lean on, on those engineers a lot to help me with, with designing some stuff. Cause we'll get, you know, we, I, I, it's probably been four or five years where we did a huge trucking warehouse and the guy wanted multiple fans throughout the whole place. And I was, that was, that one was over my head cause it was like 20,000 square feet. And I'm like, Whoa, okay. You know, let's, let me get a grasp on this. And, and I really leaned on, on the engineers at that time to, Hey, here's our building design. Here's what the customer wants. Is it feasible, you know, or what can we recommend him to do? And we, we made it work. We, didn't do quite as many fans as he wanted, but it, it was the end result is what they were looking for. Let's put it that way. And I had another question and I just lost it trying to keep a hold of it. <clears throat> Dang it. I really can't remember what it was. It just flew out. That happens from time to time. Um, <laughs> So I've got a question for you. I, I uh -oh. have yet, I have yet to quote unquote, pop my bot, my Bosch cherry. So Dude. I, it's not that I'm scared of the equipment, but you know, you just, you just hear all these things and I, you know, me, I love inverter and I've been dying to do a Bosch package unit on somewhere, you know, what is. I mean, what is your, 
you're the Bosch guy, dude. What is your input on 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 this so, new this new that's equipment a, coming? That's coming a great to... question. It's a great question. Um, <laughs> whenever you want that first five ton eighteen series, you let me know, and hell, I'll get it to you. <clears throat> um, I'll find a way. But so I will say this, you know, I've sold. You know, people heard me. You know, heard it talked about for years on the show. I sold another product for many, many years. My dad, you know, has been selling that product since 1990. You know, it was the first time he changed equipment brands. Took him 13 years to make a change to do something else. And he's been with this one for the 30 something years since. Yeah. So, you know, I, I was born and bred on a, a kind of a red looking ball, <laughs> I guess you could say, um, <laughs> You know, and that's what I did. And, and I mean, I still, I still love that brand to, to this day for, for what it's meant to my career. And, you know, if it weren't for, for that brand and a certain sub brand of it, you know, I wouldn't be where I'm sitting today. So, yeah, but I will say, you know, there were things about that product when I first learned about it years ago and it just, what the things that they did made a lot of sense. They had a great performing piece of gear in it but it didn't it wasn't over engineered and I, I look at what a lot of other major manufacturers now have as inverter product and it's great products I'm not knocking any of it but the controls and all the other things that are designed into this now one raise the price a whole whole lot mm-hmm. and for the amount more you're spending I truly don't think you're actually extracting that right. much more out of it and you're creating so many other potential problems in between indoor and outdoor unit you know or within package unit if they even have an inverter package unit mm-hmm. if it's creating so much more problem to happen if you look at what Bosch has done and this is why I appreciate it the most is they've taken you know, the years of understanding this inverter technology, but they've put it into a system that makes it very simple for contractors to get into the inverter game and have a lot of success. Yeah. Because you can literally put, you know, a $65 thermostat on the wall with a Bosch product and it's going to do its thing and you don't have to worry about it. And you didn't spend, you know... $1,800 $1,800 on one thermostat with all these other things rolled into it that if you don't have this, you can't see an error code. If you don't buy this plug-in, you can't see this on your computer. You don't, it, they took all of that out of it. Yeah, I really, I really and, like that. And they built an inverter product that the everyday contractor can learn how to use and be very successful with. And it also, the on the distribution side of it, the amount of skew reduction <laughs> yeah. with with what they do is also a game changer. Because if you look at, you know, most every standard brand right now, you know, they're going to have a ton and a half through a five ton. You got seven ton, or excuse me, seven different model numbers. Yep. And then you go to the next seer, you got seven more, the next year, seven more. So you go through four or five seer levels. I mean, you got what, 28 outdoor units and that's just pumps. Yeah, it's crazy. Then you're going to do the same thing on ACs. I mean, the amount of stuff you have to stock to try to to also be able to quickly react to customer changes and growth is a whole, that's a lot more difficult too. You know, then you switch to, you look at the Bosch side of things, you know, I've got seven outdoor units. That's it. Yeah, that's nice. That's easy. That's that's easy um, to manage, you know? And, and, as, and as some of it's changing, you know, I'm actually going down to where I'm only really going to have five. Because the 18 seer Bosch is going to go away with this transition. And yeah. you're going to see the IDS Ultra come, come out, which is what you saw in Chicago if you went by the Bosch yeah. booth. That was that newer yeah. unit. So that thing is an ultra heat driven, you know, low temp heat pump. Yeah. But, you know, then we're going to have seven outdoor units. There's six furnaces. I only need three of them, you know, in most cases. You know, it's not a ton of coils. It's there. You've got maybe 28, 30 SKUs in the whole product line. If you really want to stock the whole thing. So it, it makes, it makes managing, you know, a multi-seer lineup so much easier. 
Oh, 100%. Because guess what? Every All the outdoor units use the same coils and the same furnaces. Yeah, it's not, oh, well, I have the condenser, but I don't have the furnace, so you got to wait. That's it. That's it. And it makes, it makes having a solution available a lot faster. And then, yeah. you know, some people aren't fans of the mix match, but um, I'm also a big fan of use the best of what you can get for whatever component you can get. So, you know, we stock... I stock some ADP products as well, which is Vansom's distributor products, um, because they've got some smaller frame air handlers that also work great with Bosch equipment. They've got a little bit more variety of coil sizes if you've got certain kinds of applications, or even if you want to have stuff in stock for retrofit applications with with a coil that's going to go back in certain places with you know an, an inverter outdoor unit. So even if you do that, I, I can't, I truly can't stress it enough to contractors that for what you get out of a Bosch unit for something that's maybe a, you know, a base sear or a base, you know, Bosch 15, Boa 15, which is their 14.5 sear two now. Um, but what you get out of that product for maybe a couple hundred bucks more than what you would for just a single stage 14.5 buddy, it is night and day. It's night and day because you're given, you're given a homeowner a completely different style and level of comfort that they don't understand even exists. Yes. That's, that's what I, you know, try and really push. That's huge on, I mean, not, not even just in murder, but you know, high efficiency equipment is, you know, it's just, they, they operate on a different level. Yep. No, it's, it's, it's different. Um, I truly don't think there is another product right now that has a better bang for its buck than what you get out of a base tier Bosch inverter. Yeah. Hands down. Well, I've been eyeballing and that's, them. And that's, not the, and that's not the sales guy in me. That's truly, if, you know, if I was looking at it through the contractor's eyes, I would have been, I would have been selling this stuff at my dad's business. Yeah. You couldn't have stopped me. Yeah. I'd have been selling it left and right because people don't understand what, what they're actually getting out of it. But as soon as you have, you know, eight, nine, ten customers that have the right system in there, they can't yeah. shut up about it and you're gonna have more business you know to do with. Yeah. Because you're the guy that solved a problem nobody else did and you did it for a fair price. Yeah. Um, which, you know, that's a great segue for you know, the, the part of the show that I'm liking to start kind of ending these on, which is a segment called Give More in 2024. Uh, it is powered by Bosch Home Comfort. So this is the first time that people will know that Bosch is a, a new sponsor of the show. So, and I also, you know, I also love saying that because Bosch did so much with, with me and helping those kids in Chicago. Yeah. Um, they have continued to do stuff. They took the instructor to Londonderry, uh, New Hampshire for a full week of, you know, in-house Bosch training as well as they're getting, you know, his classroom ready for this fall. So oh, that's cool. they've done a huge bit. Yeah. So kind of in, in the spirit of that, I want to just ask a couple questions for you to be able to give back a little bit of personal knowledge. Sure. So, you know, what advice would you give to someone considering an HVAC career, you know, in you know in sales account management or on any side of the business um i i would say on on the sales side definitely know your product you know as much as you can anyway you know like you and i had discussed that that the market's changing so rapidly um but on the sales side definitely you know know your product and just be yourself you know don't don't I've all, I, you know, I learned on the no pressure sales training and it's, it's worked very well, but when I feel like you get that weird vibe that someone is just trying to sell you something, it's, mm -hmm. you get a negative effect rather than, you know, a positive effect or, or a sale, I guess if you want to call it that. Um, but getting, you know, getting into HVAC in general. You know, I, I personally like to hire younger guys and some of, some of my best guys were, were green, you know, they, they, they didn't know much at all. And, and, you know, you mold them and teach them. And the biggest thing is just, you know, do, 
take your time and do the work the right way. Don't cut corners. Do the work how it's supposed to be done. You know, we're we're in such a weird time, you know, where it everybody's just how fast can I get this done? How much money can I make? And you know, that that only goes so far. You know, if you if you truly educate yourself and and you know know your equipment and know what you're doing and you're doing stuff the right way that goes a lot farther than how fast can I get this done for this customer you know because yep. at the end of the day people don't care about how fast you can get it done they want it done the right way you know and they want they want to feel comfortable knowing that you know hey I'm gonna you know call whoever and you know I call them because I know it's going to be done the right way and that's that's something I've always tried to, you know, build off of is, you know, we're, we're, I'm not the cheapest guy and I'm not going to say I'm the fastest guy that'll get there right away. But, you know, when we, I've kind of built it to where people know that when they call me, it's, I know it's going to be done right. And I know that when I do call him, he's going to answer the phone, you know? <laughs> yeah. Well, and, but, and you know, you're going to do a quality do, job do what you say for you're a do, good you know? price yeah. and take care of you. Yes. That's what you're going to do. Yeah. So I, I who actually, is... I, sorry, go ahead. No, no, go ahead. I'm, I'm actually, you know, being, being at this AHR this, this last year is, I think is great. It, and, you know, social media is kind of crazy where, you know, you have all these influencers and, and they're, you know, they're pushing the product and they're pushing the knowledge. And, and I think all that's great. But I, you know, when, when I was in high school and going into the trades, you know, it was early two thousands and we were kind of looked at as, you know, less than where it was mm -hmm. like, Oh, you're yep. going to be a construction guy. You know, what, what are you going to do that for? You know, that's hard work. And now, here we are 20 years later where it's kind of funny because I was talking with one of my buddies who's a, a web designer and he's building me a website and he's kind of like, well, man, I'm going to be, need, be needing asking you for a job, you know, here shortly because AI is <laughs> going to take mine. And he was like, it's kind of crazy, you know, because 20 years ago, everyone, you know, that went into construction was kind of like, you know, everybody else. Oh, no, you know, I'm going to go do, you know, whatever I want to sit at a desk or, you know, and nothing against that, that, you know, everybody has a choice to do what they want to do, but you know, yep. long, long story short, being 20 years later now, I kind of like where everything is at. Cause I feel like the trades are sexy again, you know, where everyone's like, you know, yeah, you know, HVAC and plumbing and electrical. And, you know, these are the guys that are, that are killing it, that are, you know, making good money. And, and, uh, let's face it. If anything does go away as far as jobs and stuff like that, blue collar will not. You know, no, people Plumbing, still electrical and HVAC is going nowhere. Yeah. So I, I, I truly love where it, trades are coming back. If you want to call it that, you know, like in the eighties, you know, that was blue collar was it. And now being in it for so long, it, it kind of felt like in the beginning, it was just kind of like, oh yeah, you know, you're a, you're a construction guy, whatever. And now it's like, oh, you know, you guys do HVAC. That's badass. You know, you guys you guys look like you're killing it and you know, it all looks good from Instagram or whatever you want to call it. People show you what they want you to see, but you know, I, yeah. I really like where the trades are going and the camaraderie and you know, the young guys coming in are, are really motivated and, and excited to be involved. If you want to call it that, you know? No, I agree with that. I had I, when Tommy Mello was on the show a couple of shows ago. We, we talked about, or I, I mentioned that I feel like the current generation that is coming into HVAC is actually, it's the most I have seen younger people request training since I've been in the industry. Yes. You know, more well, people are asking questions. I do think, I do think social media has helped, help the younger generation to see those things and help kind of bring about, you know, a, some difference of opinion because more people now see the things that we've, we've done and we go through and they're like, Oh dang, really? Okay. Um, because that they, they didn't never knew what we actually did or understood yeah. the things we actually did. And now, now between YouTube and everything else, they can see it more. Um, yeah. and also I know it creates a lot more, you know, armchair quarterbacks, but 
<laughs> yeah, see, there's a lot of haters that you go know, with it. There's a lot of yeah. that, but I think yeah. I think it's helped. The exposure has helped. So, and you know, when when you and I both started in HVAC, obviously social media was not a part of it. But over the last several years, you know, you and I both have 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 kind of grown in that that network of people. So, have you got you know any social media mentors or people that have become colleagues that you know you think have actually helped you know influence? some changes and different things in your career and how has that helped you grow? You know, I, I talked to a lot of those guys on there and I think it's great where guys can bounce off of each other. You know what I mean? Because yep. you kind of, you get in the hustle and bustle and, and, and let's face it, when you're on a roof at eight o'clock at night, you know, you're by yourself. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. But when you've got these other guys all over the country who are doing the same thing that you are, it, it really kind of helps self motivate that, you know, you're not essentially in it alone. You know what I mean? Where, yep. um, I feel like it, it helps mentally, you know, keep people motivated to keep moving rather than stop. And on the influencer side, I think, you know, the guys that are, that are actually really you know, educating, like, you know, Jeff posts his stuff where he, you know, he shows people how to, you know, make a fitting or where he's, you know, using press or installing a unit. And a lot of these young guys grasp on that where they're like, mm -hmm. Oh, you know, okay, that's how it works. You know, I, I you know, I, I'd love to do that. And I think on that side of it, the, the educating side is huge. You know, I'm not a big fan of the whole, okay, you know, I'm going to sell this product and, you know, you pay me. I'm not really about that. You know, that's, that yeah. has a, that has a place and a purpose, which is great, but I really enjoy the educating side of things that, that the guys are doing, you know, and, and really motivating people to get more involved with the trades. I, I really enjoy that. No. And I agree with that. You know, that was at times I feel like that's, taken a little bit longer to do to get sponsors and do some different things because I didn't want to I don't want to turn into you know I'm here for the affiliate link yeah um, <clears throat> you know I, I want to either either you're sponsoring me you know we'll do an ad an ad for it in the show we'll break it into it it'll be something we talk about but you're you're doing it because you feel you've got a solid product that if people hear the name and just hear hear the things about it they'll they'll at least take a look at it check it out and they'll yep. you're also people know that i'm i'm truly not going to bullshit you on this show um yeah. if i don't get to be me on this show or if i don't get to be me where i'm working then i'll do a different show and i'll work somewhere else yeah um i don't know how to be a different type of salesperson than i am or be a different person than i am yep. and i don't want to be that sales guy that's sitting in the room with you and you're going yeah he's just here to sell me something yeah because yeah. he's got no soul left Right. And, so. that, and that, and that's exactly what, what I'm leaning on, you know, like with like perfect example with the podcast, with the sponsoring, you know, most definitely you, you need to have sponsors to keep, you know, to keep the show moving. And on your end, I love it that your sponsors are stuff you truly, you know, believe in like Bosch for one thing, you know, yep. you sell the product day in and day out. So that's absolutely amazing. It's when you get these guys online that are just like selling you, you know, they're selling one thing one day and they're selling something else the next and selling something else the next. It's just like, man, you know, do you, are you a tradesman or, you know, are you, <laughs> you see, you just trying to sell people stuff, you know, it, it it's kind of crazy. Well, and it's, it's sometimes, you know, a free tool is nice, but yeah. you know, as soon as you get one thing free, someone else wants to send it to you free because they just want to get free content out of you. Don't don't let yourself become a that's yeah. for lack of better term, don't be a content whore. Yes. I don't know how that's I hate to say it. I don't know how else to even phrase that one, but there's yeah, probably a better way to do it, but well, I'm too redneck for that. That's um, pretty much where, <laughs> where I was going with it too, you know. And and don't get me wrong, it's 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 great to to promote our products as well, you know, in the trades, you know, but these I I feel like 
I feel like the younger guys are grasping for the low hanging fruit sometimes where they're like, you know, I'm just going to sell this and sell this and sell this. It's like, you know, slow it down a little bit. You know, where do you want to go with this? You know, focus on that product. Then if you, you know, you want to be an advocate mm-hmm. for them, that's great. Go for it. You know? So kind of last little question as you go, you know, as we keep going through the rest of this year, if you had to give, you know, let's say 30 seconds, not even that, the best piece of advice for both personal and professional growth from your point of view at this part of your career to someone just getting started. Someone always told me, do what you say you're going to do. So if you tell somebody you're going to show up tomorrow, you better show up. Don't just do what you say you're going to do, whether it's, you know, showing up to do a project or, whatever piece of equipment you're going to install, stick to that, you know, just be yourself, do what you say you're going to do. If you, if you do HVAC, you do plumbing, you do electrical, whatever it may be, you know, you get as educated as possible and, you know, just (laughs) don't try and be a jackass and try and be a (laughs) know-it-all. I, 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 I talk to a lot of guys in the supply houses and a lot of the old timers and you know, they, they see me as a young guy, you know, but I've been in it for a long time and they know that. And they're like, you know, you're, you're so grounded for, for being a young guy and, and, you know, being whatever you want to call it, you know, well off or whatever, but you know, it's just, just be yourself, you know? that goes that goes a long way and especially for me you know when when i was hard into residential sales i wasn't even i wasn't even selling a product you know i was i was selling our work ethic more than anything Mm -hmm. you know and that's huge you know people don't care what a lot of time what it says on the box you know i could sell anything to them if if it's all about how it's put in yeah if they truly believe that you're a good person and you do good work and they don't care what brands on the box, you know, they'll, they'll go with whatever you recommend. It's just, you know, be yourself and, and yeah, do what you say you're going to do, I guess. Ryan, this has been such a fun conversation. I'm glad we finally got to have it. Yeah. We, need to do it. we definitely need to do it again. We definitely yeah, need to we'll break to bread up. if we can, when we have time in Orlando. Most definitely. We'll have to hit in Orlando and, you know, get some dinner and, Absolutely. Around the HR, you know? Hell yeah. So thank you so much for taking some time to speak with me. Thank you for giving all of your advice and your knowledge and your years of experience um, and sharing it with the trade crew. If you're not following HVAC R&D online, you can find me on Instagram and TikTok at HVAC.R&D. You can also find me as the HVAC R&D podcast on LinkedIn, Trade Hounds, and Facebook. Please make sure to go follow Ryan on Instagram at Top Gun Mechanical underscore. Any other ones you want them to, you want to throw out the bro and the pops and get them following them too? Yeah, my brother is Fig HVAC, and then my dad's under RNK Air Conditioning. So yeah, make sure to go follow the uh, the Figueroa family trio. And thank you so much for listening to the show. If you're listening on your favorite platform today, please make sure to like and follow the show. Leave me a rating. Leave me a review. Share the show with your friends and your trade crew. Don't forget to check out the website, hvacrnd.com, and go check out the swag shop. If you want to work with me or be a sponsor, you know how to do that. So have a great week, trade crew. I'll catch you soon. Peace. Thank you, man. Appreciate it.